The announcement trailer for Sonic Frontiers had me elated. You might want to look that one up. But who am I to be talking about Sonic? Just a fan. This franchise has been with me since I was an itty baby boy. I can remember having a copy of Sonic R for PC. When I was younger, I'd take it to school to play with my friends during break, and we'd make up chance so that we'd win races against Metal Knuckles and Reactive Factory. I had all these games on the list by name. Heck, I even played Dark Brotherhood. Pretty sure I got my certification for that one. The point is, when I saw Sonic Frontiers trailer for the first time, I grinned like an idiot at its potential. The last time I did that was Sonic Unleashed, and we all know how that went. Then again, I also grinned at Lost World, so maybe I don't have the greatest track record for knowing a good Sonic game when I see one. Or do I? We are looking at a whole new era of Sonic, people. I mean, just look at this game. Do you see that? That beautiful blue sky, all that lush green stuff? I'm explaining it like this because there's someone watching this video. These ideas probably make you very uncomfortable. It's the great outdoors! With all the fresh grass and tall trees, it's like Sonic Team is saying it's time to turn over a new leaf. After all, Sonic Frontiers is aimed at an entirely new audience than before. How do I know that? Because I watched someone watch someone else tell us that he spoke to the game's producer, Takashi Azuka, and what he basically said was that Sega's mission for Sonic Frontiers is to introduce a new normal. Based on what we've seen so far, he's doing that by implementing a fully customizable Sonic pumping up the action, and reintroducing hub worlds. And with the announcement of multiple playable characters, this all starts to make much more sense. Considering that we're in an age where games like Pokemon Legends Arceus and Zelda Breath of the Wild are being released, and essentially serve as a foundation for what comes next, it's important for speculators to look at what we've been given here, and see where we can go forward from there. Sonic Frontiers has been out for a while now, and we've had two DLC drops already, and we're waiting for the third one. But the good thing about being late to the party is that I get to talk about what comes next. So let's begin. As luckily for me, Sonic Frontiers gave us quite a lot to work with. I recall Ian Flynn, a writer of the Sonic comic who helped write the game, saying that he wanted to advance the characters' personal stories to bring some interconnectivity to the previous games. It seems that one way Sonic Team did this was to have Sonic make a lot of name drops throughout the game. And while they're not the easiest thing to come across, a lot of these references solidify the Sonic canon, almost as if they were acting as a vague recap for the series. Kind of like how Sonic Generations reminded us that the storybook game's canon. Considering that we hear Sonic mention Tangle in Frontiers, should we expect to see the Sonic the Hedgehog IDW comic book universe characters in locations in the Sonic the Hedgehog video game universe? Does that canonize the mobile games? Did someone actually murder Sonic? I should really play that. As a quick rundown of the plot so far, cyberspace is an ancient alien database dimension made by an ancient civilization who intended to install this system into their new home in order to store their memories. These ancients have been hopping from location to location, hoping to escape an extinction level event. The Chaos Emeralds guide them to land on the Starfall Islands. Unfortunately, their demons caught up to them, leaving their civilization in ruin and leaving their charms, the Coco, to hold the memories of the lost generation to fall. Present day, we see Sonic and Tails meeting up with Amy, who's been taken on Dr. Eggman and his badniks as they terrorize an island. Once the gang gets together, they make quick work of this bossnik, only for Sonic to find that this is a red herring. Upon reflecting, Tails and Amy realize that an egg mech located near Starfall Islands where the Chaos Emeralds are gathering can only mean that the Doctor is up to no good, and so the team sets the course. Soon after, Dr. Eggman lands on Kronos Island, unusual business, awaken an ancient power and manipulate it to do your bidding to rule the world. But letting frustration and pride get the best of him, the Doctor skipped over integration tests for his new AI, Sage, who voices concern, but he dismisses this as he intends to stay one step ahead of Sonic and his friends. After setting up camp and deploying some mechs, Dr. Eggman goes on an expedition to survey Kronos Island and hack into one of the portal thrones. His attempt to unveil the secrets behind the ancient's technology seems successful, but Sage has been running integration tests in the background, succeeding in integrating with the island's systems. To his surprise, the ancients had put up a defense mechanism that would pull them into cyberspace if there was a threat present. Under the circumstances, Sage initiates her protective initiative, pulls Dr. Eggman into cyberspace, and seizes control over parts of cyberspace and the Starfall Islands. One rainy night, 
Knuckles embarks on a journey to learn more about the history of his position as the guardian of Master Emerald. While exploring the sanctuaries floating in the skies of Angel Island, he finds a portal gear laying outside an unfamiliar ruin that houses a disheveled looking portal throne. Upon slotting the gear into place, the throne teleports Knuckles into cyberspace, where he gets ambushed by a group of sentinels. After taking out the Ops, Knuckles calls to be taken to whoever is behind the ambush, but is faced with the overwhelming presence of the Guardian Ashura and the mysterious figment of Sage. The next day, as Sonic, Tails, and Amy arrive at Starfall, the tornado loses control and is sucked into cyberspace through a portal, separating Sonic from the others. Sonic finds himself running through a mixed up recreation of places from his past, managing to escape through his own power. Waking up on Kronos Island, a disembodied voice calls to Sonic, calling him the key that will break the boundary between dimensions, which he takes as a sign that he can rescue his friends. And from there, the game loop begins. When I heard about the concept for Sonic Frontiers for the first time, I thought there were glaring similarities to Sonic Generation's plot. Sonic's friends are stuck in his memories, and to free them from stasis, he has to run through zones taken from his past. Only, cyberspace doesn't have Sonic remembering areas while traveling through time, but instead having a sort of nostalgic incursion, wherein all his past adventures come crashing into a vague expressionist conceptualization of ideas and locations, as we see with the rehashed layouts in other overrepresented environments, which I'll go into shortly. Initially, this idea of a nostalgia trip led me to ask, did they give Sonic amnesia? Then I started to speculate about how the story would advance Shadow's relationship with Sonic. Like, what if they had a mentorship dynamic? Where Shadow would lead Sonic through the path of finding himself as someone who has experienced this himself. But it seems like they'd save that for Sonic Prime. But the way some of these assets were used in Sonic Frontiers had me thinking, what would this look like in a different environment? What if these rails ran up the side of a building? These enemies seem like they could be used to take me to a different area. Anyway, everything you thought you knew about Sonic lore is dead. The Chaos Emeralds are alien jewels, but the Master Emerald seems to have always resided on the planet. The design of the Ancients seem indicative to the deity Chaos, and the Ancients possibly gave the Chaos Emeralds to the Knuckles tribe, but could also be a separate tribe that predates the Echidnas by millennia. But before we talk about where we go next, let's talk about how we got here. Back before Frontiers was released, Ian Flynn said that he wanted to portray Eggman as a quote unquote flesh and blood human being. The last time they did something like that is when they made him scratch his own ass. And so, before release, I thought, a story that connects Sonic and Shadow? Flesh and blood Eggman? Where have we seen that before? But after having played the game, and remembering he also said that he wanted to bring some interconnectivity to the previous titles, I'm beginning to notice some parallels to other games in the plot of Sonic Frontiers. An ancient guardian imprisons himself with an ancient force. Eggman unleashes said ancient force that wiped out the Guardian civilization, who protected the Chaos Emeralds. An Eggman robot longs for companionship and eventually sacrifices itself. Big goes fishing. The annihilation of the ancient civilization is revealed to our characters through a series of flashbacks. Despite Sonic collecting the Chaos Emeralds and taking out the Titans, the ancient power awakens and threatens to destroy everything. And so, Sonic dives headfirst into the ancient force to stop it. I don't know what it is, but something about it is familiar. Anyway, here's a short story about Sonic the Hedgehog. If you aren't aware, Sonic the Hedgehog transitioned, but it wasn't easy. And that's because creating a three-dimensional Sonic the Hedgehog gaming experience while keeping the connectivity between levels, as seen in Sonic 3, all while taking full advantage of this new axis for the first time, is a very difficult task to undertake. Admittedly, Mario had some good ideas with the whole castle ground that opened up new areas to explore as you played, but you can't coop Sonic up in one room. On top of being claustrophobic, this dude refuses to sit still. And that's great, because lead director Takashi Azuka has always wanted to make Sonic an action star. And you're bound to run into action when you're in this city. The thing about Sonic Adventure, though, is that in actuality, it is an action-adventure RPG with elements of platforming. Which, as Izuka believes, means there has to be spectacle, and a lot of it. But in 1998, you couldn't really keep the entire length of an airborne battleship, a dense cliffside jungle, a bustling city fitted with hotels, casinos, and an amusement park, and an ancient floating continent, all on a single map in one CD boy. And so, Sonic Team took a few creative liberties. 
The end. Generally speaking, action zones have always been used to represent the wild goose chase, a mad dash. They're an abstract depiction of what it's like running around an environment to reach a destination. While it's been confirmed that there are naturally forming loop-de-loops on this planet, I highly doubt that pedestrians are driving their cars through loops or bouncing off of bumpers every week so that they can get their shopping done. I'd expect these loops to be more common in places such as South Island. Furthermore, if you take a look at stages such as Metropolis Zone in Sonic Heroes, you can see the environment of the stage underneath the platforms. This idea can even be seen in the cities behind Chemical Plant Zone, further illustrating my point that these action zones are simply abstract representations of any given location. With that out the way, let's talk about hub worlds. Sonic fan word association time. I say hub worlds, you say Station Square, right. In Sonic Adventure, Station Square is one of several locations where you spend time when you're not in an action zone. It serves as a respite between levels and even establishes where each one is set. This makes Station Square a hub world. Hold on. Sonic makes references both to Cream and the Chow Garden in Sonic Frontiers. Are we getting the Chow Garden back? Anyway. At different points in the game, you have to solve interactive puzzles within these hub worlds in order to access the action zones. You know what I'm talking about. Being in the mystic ruins, carrying the windstone from Tails' workshop down to the cavern so the winds could whisk you up to Windy Valley, or finding the keycard in the middle of Station Square and swiping it to get into the garage before racing around Speed Highway. Yeah, those are puzzles. There was another game that had hub worlds, Sonic World Adventure. As the name suggests, you go on an adventure around the world, every part of which, if your parents love you, would have its own playable hub world. Each of these hub worlds has sub worlds where you can play at your own pace to collect a certain amount of medals or solve puzzles that open up areas and allow you to enter the pretty action stages. Keep that in mind. Sonic World Adventure follows the same pattern of using the action stages to serve as an abstraction of the route Sonic takes to get to where he needs to be to confront Eggman or the bots the good doctor has kindly littered around each of the continents. They play similar to the ones you see in modern stages in Generations and throughout Frontiers. But what separates some of these action stages from the rest was the introduction of combat-focused stages. In these stages, we get a rich list of moves as well as a combo counter. Unfortunately, Sega couldn't bring themselves to have their usually blue golden boy throw hands without turning him into a literal beast. Although, while it did yang the yin of bursting through robots at supersonic speeds, the inclusion of combat in a Sonic game had the potential to change the series forever. In Sonic Frontiers, we're introduced to open zones, which are essentially big hub worlds with a few different environments. Each one is littered with game-like activities, challenges, and collectibles throughout, some of which are used to progress the story in a fairly traditional Sonic fashion, while allowing you to roam freely and take things at your own pace. These open zones are much larger than any other hub world we've gotten to explore in past Sonic games. While there are three areas to explore freely in 2006's Sonic the Hedgehog, none of them compare to the scale of the Starfall Islands, even individually. Some aspects the two games do share, however, are the RPG-like elements that come in the form of challenges and upgrade stations. In Sonic 06, you can find challenges by talking to civilians who have a coloured icon above their heads, and level up your characters by purchasing abilities from a shopkeeper. While in Frontiers, Challenges are found in plain sight, and you can upgrade Sonic's abilities through talking to the Elder and Hermit Coco and spending skill points in the skill menu to acquire skills from the skill tree. Only, these skills aren't reflected in cyberspace. What's up with cyberspace anyway? In an interview with Takashi Azuka in October of 2022, Shaq News asked about cyberspace and revisiting this has confirmed a lot of what I understood about the levels and their themes. My belief was that the aesthetics used with each cyberspace level correlates to the stage layouts to some degree. For instance, we see the stage layout of Windy Hill applied to Green Hill Zone's visual style, and both stages share the same purpose in their respective games as an introductory level. The same goes for Sky Sanctuary and Dragon Road, both stages are considerably mystical places. Cyberspace serves as a trial in the style of a short-form spectacle, where players get to dash like a maniac through different environments in order to receive keys to unlock the Chaos Emerald Vaults and progress the game. When asked in the interview, Izuka states that the level designers wanted to put in these little easter eggs as a nod to Sonic fans. The team really want to take it even one step further, and uh, they wanted to make content that our fans would definitely pick up on a lot of the creative kind of easter eggs that they put in there. 
So yes, it's obvious that, oh, this is Green Hill's owner Sky Sanctuary, but even some of the level design is taken and repurposed and put in a different format for people to kind of understand as an Easter egg and kind of a, a wink from the uh, game developers to the, uh, the fan audience. What I believe that nod means is to look towards these levels as a point of the kind of areas we can expect to come next. So I'm gonna put like a ramble on the cyberspace music because they give a lot of context to the themes that are within Sonic Frontiers. For instance, we have one called Constructure, which you can look at as a comment on what cyberspace is, or these levels in cyberspace are, because they are just reconstructions of what Sonic's experienced in the past, with the whole skinning over different kind of like environments with ones that we're a lot more familiar with. We get like themes from each of the first three Sonic games. We get Green Hill Zone, Chemical Plant, and Sky Sanctuary as representatives for each game. And those are very familiar and play to like the, the nostalgia of uh, Sonic players. As well as having recently released Sonic Origins, we get to kind of like combine like the experiences of new and old players uh, into this new experience of Sonic to kind of be like, well, you know, you've come from the classics and now we're in this modern place and you recognize the themes, but you don't quite recognize the areas because they're from other games that are quite, well, I don't want to say like less recognized, but they're not as um, mainstream. But there's also that whole aspect of Sonic Origins just came out, and if you want to play Sonic Origins and then come and play Frontiers, then you get to have that kind of familiarity while experiencing something new. Dropaholic, absolute banger of a song. <laughs> nothing more, nothing less. Back to your roots, you know, we've got a cyberspace level called Back to Your Roots, using the theme of Green Hill Zone. One Six takes elements from Sonic Generations, which is all about Sonic going back to his roots quite literally because he's going through time now, or then he was going through time. And to pair a song with that and call it Back to Your Roots, I want to say, is very on the nose. Go back to your roots, like start from where you came from and grow from there is the message that I'm getting from that. Heavenly Sky on the Dragon Road Sky Sanctuary level. Heavenly Sky, just as I said, you get that uh, mysticism from both of them. And then to combine that with the name of the song, Heavenly Sky, you know, the heavens are also mystical in the same way. You know, you get themes of floating islands and such from this. I wanna look at 4-8, No Pain, No Gain. I think that is a lot of the theming of <laughs> Sonic Frontiers and potentially, potentially, the experience of making the game for Sonic Team while being directed by Izuka, who seems to be struggling with having that whole past of Sonic being beaten down by critics and being memed to death to the point that it like bastardized the branding and the the idea of Sonic itself that no one took it seriously and now coming out of that and like putting his whole heart into something that he makes for kind of for himself and like an entirely different audience you know he's taking all that pain bringing it with him and like putting it out into this new experience which seems to be very well received. I say it seems because we always know that in the future people will always change their mind about stuff and like trying to you know make a new name for it for for himself and for Sonic and so no pain no gain is that kind of like you know it hurts but you gotta get back up and you gotta go back out there and do what you gotta do to let the whole world know your name. Oh and also fuck that level. After taking everything into consideration, let me ask you this. Wouldn't it be great if you could actually get on top of the structures in Station Square, then make a rooftop run to wherever you wanted to go next, like you can towards the end of Speed Highway? What if you could tear through the steep streets of City Escape, building up enough momentum to send you flying over the tops of those San Francisco-style hills, where you can soar over the houses and take in the view? What if you were able to explore these areas with no boundaries? To finally run around the streets of Empire City with the same freedom Spider-Man has while swinging around New York. 
all the while making split-second decisions on whether to dodge past enemies trying to hold you at a blockade by finding a new route on the fly, or facing them head-on by exhibiting your mastery over an improved combat system. With the exceedingly positive reception of Sonic Frontiers, I believe Sonic Team will feel inspired to create some truly incredible Sonic games, the likes of which Sonic fans have only ever dreamed of. Take a moment to imagine a city with incredible skate park inspired architecture, while playing as Sonic with improved parkour mechanics that allow you to swing from lampposts, or reenact the down building run from Speed Highway whenever you want, or having Tails take part in stealth missions, unlocking egg memos by hacking into egg tech facilities, and piecing together clues about the Doctor's master plan. What better way to understand the full potential of a character's capabilities than giving them a whole lot of room to run around in? Throughout Frontiers, you can definitely notice that Sonic has grown overconfident, and his act-before-you-think attitude plays against him big time as he tries to boost to win his friends back from Techno Limbo. I speculate that Sonic Team believes that Sonic has lost his way, and is using Starfall Islands and Sonic Frontiers as a whole to help set Sonic off on the right foot. They realize that the thing that's been plaguing Sonic for the majority of his career is landing a solid playstyle that works well in the third dimension. After Update 3, the final horizon drops. I think that instead of the next game being called Sonic Frontiers 2, we'll be more likely to see something along the lines of Sonic Frontiers A New Dawn. How do I imagine this progresses? Parkour returns with an advanced trick system. I want to choose when I trick rather than interacting with certain springs or free falling. Also, can we get an option to wall run? These black walls are so iffy, or at least fix these slopes. Like, look at this shit. The return of hub walls with a variety of environments. How about we have missions and side missions that encourage exploration, maybe replacing the Elder Coco with characters who ask the player to pick up collectibles around the hub world in exchange for skill upgrades. Cyberspace or boost style levels being used to convey the journey within or between hub worlds using different routes to act as different stages. If we're thinking of ways of integrating other characters into the games, one way to reintroduce Shadow is to give him back his role as Agent Shadow, like we see in Sonic 06. Whether he's working for Gun or investigating on his own, just give us back that sleuth that Shadow was. But what's still unanswered? Well, Update 3, with multiple playable characters. Possibly it's a remix of the adventure hero formula. Will we get some more writing from Ian Flynn to match the more melancholic tone of the IDW comics with moments of slice of life, kind of like we see in Frontiers? And what's up with Supersonic Blue? Is this form related to having escaped cyber corruption twice and becoming more attuned to the Chaos Emeralds? Could the blue eyes represent true sight, unblinded by chaos? Or is he just more focused, like when he gets max rings? Would that make rings more important in-universe? Does this new form push the greater Sonic lore forward, like a lot of Frontiers made an effort to do? Does the new form kind of symbolize Sonic Team embracing the edge? Because it kind of feels a little like that aura that Shadow gets when he has Chaos Blast. And also Chaos Control in Shadow the Hedgehog is blue, and Sonic's eyes are blue. This is just on-the-fly speculation though, I don't know. There was definitely a theme around all the material we received around Sonic's 30th anniversary. Not only is the premise of Sonic Prime focused on Sonic finding himself through the multiverse, but Sonic Frontiers seems to have themes of reflection and moving on. Sonic Team has clearly done a lot of thinking before taking Sonic whichever direction they're going. I mean, look at all the synergy going on around the game's release. Cyberspace has levels based on stages found in Sonic Origins, which new players would be familiar with. Origins has character bios that offer a basic introduction to Sonic's friends, who are now playable in Sonic Frontiers and Superstars. Sonic Origins connects the first games through cutscenes, plus we get to take a look at Sonic's history adventuring on different islands in Sonic Origins, just like we do in Sonic Frontiers. It's all a way to ease new players into the densely established universe that Sonic games have built up until now. There's a very big focus on different things coming together to make everything better, so much so that even the music in Sonic Frontiers leans toward this idea. Given the evidence, I believe that Sega is trying to evolve the Sonic gaming franchise by performing a sort of soft reset to the theming and mood of the 3D games. In conclusion, it would be fair to see Sonic Frontiers as a very pretty tech demo, similar to what Game Freak did with Pokemon Legends Arceus. Sonic Team is aware that Sonic is in need of change, and this reimagined open zone format is the direction that they want to go. 
Essentially, this brings us back to square one in terms of 3D games, taking Sonic back to his roots in explorable islands just like the classics, while potentially saying farewell to the past era of gaming through the dwindling memories of cyberspace. Since this could make or break the Sonic franchise, I think it's time we cut the guys some slack. Sure, Sonic games have had their experiments in the past with werehogs, wisps, and parkour, but none have been quite as ambitious to go as far as an open-world focus. And while these experiments have been benched thanks to Sonic's reputation and Izuku's response to criticism, they've not all been awful. I'm certain that if we had given them a better chance, or been more constructive in our criticism, Sonic games would have gone in a much different direction. And with that, I said my piece. Sonic fans, I implore you, open your heart. Be kind to Sonic Frontiers. Uh, P.S. The pinball was a joke! Sega was originally called Service Games. They used to make pinball machines before they made video games. They call it ancient technology because it comes all the way from 1971. It would scr <laughs> how does How does Fidel do it? He just goes, Gra! Does he just, Gra? Gra. Well, whatever. Gra. I spice in that, innit? Whatever. Bye.